why do NB people say they aren't male or female if those are sex terms? Because I'd rather not remind myself that the reproductive organs in my body will never match who I am nor do I want strangers to know what gender I was assigned at birth as. And in general when talking about one's transition it's the language typically used. It's only relevant when dating or at a doctor's appointment. Otherwise it's not really anyone's business what sex they were born as. They aren't going to want to be reminded they were born a certain way. Especially with strangers. There is a study that kind of blew that idea out of the water when they discovered gender development in the womb and its direct link to hormones and biological sex. But they also discovered something else. The exact test used for gender, is that the same one for identity. So yeah it's literally just identity and how the Rain's biochemical functions when it comes to choices and what parts of the brine lights up. All of the studies four looked at seem to use the exact same focus on if someone has brine damage and checking to see if their personality exists. So identity and personality are what they define gender as. Highly suggest Pia look at or read T her studies since not all is as it seems. I think that your question seems to imply you're going around trying to sex people like they are barnyard animals. By knowing what genitals they were born with. What sex were you born? Is a weird slash invasive question to ask anyone. Because people tend to identify more by their gender and sexuality. Not by their birth sex. I imagine that question feels even more invasive for many non-binary people than for cis people. Especially if they identify as asexual or non-gendered. To put it another way, if I present myself as neither man nor woman in my gender presentation. Why would I want you to know about my genitals unless we are intimately involved? That's personal. They eat hot cereal? Apparently they've never heard of it before. To know my classmates? Yeah. Many times a week. No but I've put ice in my cereal. Crunchy nut cornflakes heated with milk is yummy. What drains your energy? There used to be this dude that was part of my wife's office team. Whenever we had a family office dinner or party, he would corner me and he spoke in this monotonous drone that made me feel like the sound of the Death Star when Obi-Wan turned off the generators. It was a ba wooo sound in my soul. Thank God I haven't seen him in over 20 years. Having to multitask or switch from tasks constantly. I returned to retail as a large food store supervisor recently. And I loathe it. Running about from truck deliveries to self-service machines breaking to upset customers to just eat deliveries and back to trying to unpack the delivery but wait the self-service machine broke again. None of my jobs in isolation are complex, it's the repeated stopping then restarting that's so testing. Alongside the fact I have to walk back semicolon forth constantly for 8 hours plus. Thinking for people. Like they struggling or quitting a thing cause they're doing it the best way they know how and you look at the situation and re-explain or present the most common sense solution you could think of in 3 seconds and it saves their day. But they couldn't think of it. Multiplied by everyone and everything they're doing and thinking for people is extremely exhausting. See also. Being hired to do a job of less importance slash and pay only to solve all the problems of my boss. And that's not getting paid enough for thinking. Certain types of people. I don't know how to explain it. But some people seem to suck all the energy out of me. When I talk to such people. After the conversation I get tired and sluggish. Usually they load me up with their problems to delegate some of that load to me and stuff like that. Such people are also often called energy vampires. They take the energy and strength of other people to themselves. I am not superstitious. But I have no other explanation. What are some cons? If any. Of getting legally married? Completely cutting ties with your ex will be longer and harder, more expensive potentially but I feel that's also true if you live together slash own a house together or especially have a kid together. This downside is not specific to marriage. Can't really think of anything else. Some people say finances but you don't have to merge finances when you marry. Personally I don't plan to at least not 100% unless some circumstances drastically change where I may rethink it. It costs money. And you also have to legally get divorced if you break up. Which also costs money. You don't get as much financial aid if you're married in Canada if you're not listed as single you won't get a GST check because as a whole. You make too much money in quad. Same with student loans. Disability assistance etc. You pay more taxes because as a whole. You make more money. Your spouse is entitled to half your assets if there was no prior prenup or anything otherwise. If you legally take your spouse's last name you have to change all your IDs and paperwork. If you have kids and divorce. There's child support to pay as well as custody and stuff. Debt transfer. Oh. Let me tell you. Getting legally married ain't all rainbows and sunshine. You feel me? First off. You gotta share your financial responsibilities with your partner. So if they're not good with money. You could be in deep trouble. Secondly. You lose some of your freedom because you gotta consider your partner's feelings and opinions before making decisions. And if things go south and you gotta split up. Getting a divorce can be a long and expensive process that'll drain you emotionally. Plus. There's a lot of social pressure to get married. Even if you're not really feeling it. So. Before you tie the knot. Make sure you really think it through. Is there such thing as toxic femininity? To me toxic masculinity is consciously leaning into one's stereotypically masculine traits to the point that your behavior becomes detrimental. There are women who do this for their feminine traits so I'd say it absolutely exists. Toxic femininity is exactly how toxic masculinity is. 
It's when people support values viewed socially as feminine as being inherently better and support them and bash others who don't follow them. Others have provided examples but other ones include, insulting women who don't wear heels, makeup, skirts and saying they don't look nice, don't care about their appearance, or specifically that they look like men slash boys. Another would be around the topic of shaving, saying you're less of a woman if you don't shave. Not saying someone can't say preferences for themselves but no one is less of a woman for not doing any of the above things. I think there's an expectation that girls are supposed to like girly things. And when one leans more into traditionally masculine hobbies like gaming for example they're labeled a pick me and a boss. It's more of a recent thing I've seen online. Also on TikTok the trend of telling who is a girl's girl and who isn't. Also boyfriend air is another recent saying I've seen around that is gross. I'd argue that yes. But not in the sense of things women do that I don't like but rather ways in which standards of femininity and female coded behaviors begin to do more harm than good. Judgmental discourse around sleep training slash breastfeeding slash natural birth would be an example. Self-mutilation for the sake of hyperfeminine beauty could be another. Both slut and prude shaming. Or other appearance-based bullying in the basis of putting other women down for being less of a proper woman could arguable constitute this as well. I think. Being passive to a harmful extreme and expecting a man to live her life for her maybe?